are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Life is not easy. It never was, and it never will be. A good life takes grit. Prioritize who you are and who you want to be, because life isn't fair, and a little grit can make all the difference. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I am joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. Good afternoon. How are you, Brent? I'm well. Thank you. Yes. So today's podcast is with our buddy Ryan Lampers. Just uh, a healthy hunter. Just a healthy hunter. Hunt Harvest Health. Basically, we do a and a session. People ask, send in questions for, yeah. for Ryan, and we kind of cover we cover that today. Ryan tells a story in this podcast that I think, if you think you're awesome, you think you're badass. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, Ryan tells a story about uh, one of his most memorable hunts. Mm -hmm. Uh, which to me is one of the most grueling hunts I've ever heard of. If Ryan Lampers is one of the most uh, genuine and legit uh, back country wilderness kind of hunters of, of uh, he's among the greatest, right. That I've, that I've personally known. And uh, on today's episode, we, we tap into his thoughts on hunting, but he, really shares a couple stories that I think are, I don't know, say more to me than all the questions. I don't know if I would say that they're awe inspiring, but they uh, definitely make me second guess my mental toughness. Yeah, I do. I think so too. I, I think it's really makes me think twice about my own drives and motivations. And um, I don't, I think we're all wired a little differently, right? Mm. But it's very, I think it's very inspiring to to listen to someone who does things very different from you or who who does just do, who is just deeply dedicated to a goal and will stop at nothing to achieve it. That's special. So, today's podcast is with Ryan. It's a good one. I hope you enjoy it. Um tomorrow's podcast is with the guys at Wild Arrow and I think you're going to enjoy that one. That one is about um arrows, really. Mm-hmm. FOC builds, arrow builds. We've talked about that a few times, but Talk this about is mechanicals this versus is, yeah. This is from their perspective, being an archery shop that is completely independent, can sell and move whatever arrows and broadheads. They don't, they don't get. They just there's put no, stuff on the shelf yeah. and they sell it. There, there's, there's no sponsorships here. Not only there's, that, but. They talk with the everyday hunter all day long, every day. Yeah, and I'd say that a lot of the products that they move are the ones with the lower profit margins. Like mm-hmm. if they really wanted to make money, um, they could sell some stuff that would do that. But they're just addicted to the... They are addicted to archery. To archery. Flat and, out and addicted. To Jeremiah the- was talking about sometimes on the weekends, they stay there till 2 or 3 in the morning <laughs> building arrows. I, I know that... No way could you get me to stay up to that. <laughs> There's always tomorrow, folks. Yeah, so that's a good one. Um, Hoyt bow giveaway. We we gave the bow away. We didn't get a response from the winner. And so we're going to reselect uh, reselect the, a winner for that. It, you, all you have to do to be entered to win is sign up for the newsletter. There was a two-step sign-up process that a lot of people missed the second step. Mm-hmm. So if you just go back to briancall.com and and uh sign up there's no two-step process you'll be you'll be locked and loaded and we're going to do that giveaway here uh in a couple of days send out yeah. a newsletter in a couple of days um we don't want to bombard your email inbox i'm not sure how many letters to send each week i think we're we're just going to send one email a week for mm-hmm. now and we're we're going to try to make it useful and meaningful to you yep. and um, but sign up because we're going to start doing some giveaways that are only going to be accessible through the newsletter itself. Yeah. I, you know, this brings up a point, you know, I, I've, I listened to that podcast with Kevin Hart and Joe Rogan the other day Yeah, yeah. and I, I really enjoyed it. And Kevin Hart mentioned, uh, you know, how being positive isn't cool. Like in today's social media space, yeah. uh, in some ways I think it is. You have guys like David Goggins or even Cameron Haynes that kind of motivate people in a positive way. But yeah, there's a lot of negativity that surrounds every, everything on social. Anyone that's positive is, is uh, setting themselves up to be hit. And 
they talked about in the, the podcast that can that Rogan did with Gabrielle Reese, which I thought was a interesting show. They talked about the effects of social media in the modern world. And I feel like it can be a, a fairly, I mean, it's a social experience, a human experience we've never had before. I mean, a girl can take a picture of her butt, post it on Instagram and get 1 million likes. You just, how, how I could you... solve world hunger if I get a million likes. That's... <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing what we're dealing with today in in the world where you know any, anybody can just go out and be part of the conversation, and there's so many ways to get noticed. Um, and then there's so much comparison going on. Uh, I found that the discussion was interesting, but all of that's to say, I I have tried to spend a lot less time on social media. I don't like its influence necessarily on my personal life. You know, I'm trying to be positive. If I'm being positive and putting out a positive message every day, then I'm doing something, something right. And so I, I want to use that platform on social to on Instagram, primarily to, sh- to post a photo or to share an idea that I find meaningful, but I don't want to spend too much time on that platform. And when I interact with the, with gritty listeners i really want to do it through the podcast medium and through the newsletter mm-hmm. and that's that's the goal and less through social because i like i said i i don't feel like it's the best place for, for me to spend a lot of time or anybody well, i think we're so is, connected is that... it's just it's not natural so we got a comment today on today's podcast episode 459 with chris spieler called intensity and uh troy westerber left us calm and he said, I love this. I work out with intensity in short bursts. I do it mostly because I find motivation hard. The thought of spending hours in the gym. I do 10 minute sets as hard as I can and try to cut my time to do the same amount of work. I mark my gains by cutting down the time spent doing the same things. When they become easy, I add more to it. My chest exercises I have dropped down to two minutes. So now I added double the sets to get it more intense. I am no fitness expert or anything, but for me, the time is what matters. I am a very busy guy that has had a lot of injuries and am not trying to be anything but feel better and not feel like I am dying trying to pack out meat. The closest to marathon training I do is hiking. That is because I am trying to build endurance in that area. I do five miles a day. But five miles a day every day translates to 10 miles of intense hikes while hunting with no problem. My thing is every day I get a little better and hopefully by next season my pack out doesn't hurt as bad as last year's. Solo packed my bull out last year and thought I was going to die doing it. So I increased my intensity and my core training on top of the endurance training. I am glad to know that I am not the only one that has this idea stay gritty thank you troy uh i agree i think this podcast with chris is is a good one really focusing on um you know what intensity means and why it matters i think troy's nailed it because let's say you have one hour 30 minutes for an ex- for a workout 30 minutes people normally have let's say um you can spend that 30 me- minutes going casual easy or you can spend that 30 minutes going balls out. The results from balls out are going to be completely different than casual. And it's the same 30 minutes. And so if your time is scarce and you really care about it, maximize it. More bang maximize for your buck. It. More bang for your buck. Give it all you got. And here's the thing. I really think that when you put yourself through grueling work every day, you go to war with yourself, as David Goggins says, every day. It changes who you are mentally. It changes who you are, who you want to be. It makes you a resilient person. It makes you stronger, tougher, more gritty. And so I feel like intensity is critical. Mm -hmm. And not every day, you know, you ought to balance that with health and family and And work and sleep and all that. But but if you're going to be there and you're going to put in the time, most of the time, give it everything you got go to war and you walk away. I feel like fulfilled in a way that you don't, when you just walk the treadmill and do some, do some, uh, 
bicep curls. <laughs> so there you have it. Um, uh, you know, we've been talking like, what's the workout that I do each day or every, you know, I, I and, or what do my, what am I eating? Mm-hmm. I, I kind of, you know, we're bringing that up on the podcast because I feel like that gives people an idea of sort of what I do. And, and I can just say, Hey, today is what I did. This is what I'm doing tomorrow and gives people an idea of what I think is useful and meaningful for me. That said, we got into this discussion the other day with some guys at the gym there to me, fitness comes in two categories. One is a playtime. It's like grown up playtime. Oh, totally. It, Heavy lifting is fun. This is playtime. This is my time to unwind, to unpack what's in my mind, to push myself to it's it's like the human monkey in me, the curiosity gets satisfied. I I, I do fun things with physically to to challenge myself. It's there's something fulfilling about it, you know, and for me that's varied workouts that are random using different tools and weights and, and time intervals. Uh, that to me is for me, that is fun. My wife, Suzanne loves to go to jazzercise. She likes music. She likes dancing. I would hate that, but for her a couple of days a week going to jazzercise is fun time. It's play time. It reduces stress. Cause it's like this, it's, it's a challenge that here, you know, she gets a little adrenaline as she goes in and, and starts to do this. She gets into it. Then there's just working out to be stronger and fitter. And I, to me, whatever motivates you, it could be running. I mean, look at Cameron Haynes. I mean, he just loves to run. Look at other guys that are more maybe like my style, CrossFit, or, or maybe somebody else. It's just, you know, powerlifting, weightlifting, heavy lifting, whatever it is for you that's fun. Do that, do that. And then, like I say, add some grown up stuff to it as well, where you do things that maybe aren't fun, but you know, are good for you, Mm -hmm. but absolutely incorporate the fun in there. So my kind of fun is today, it's going to be three rounds of 21 thrusters at 95 pounds, 15 sumo deadlift high pulls and nine ring muscle ups. So by the time I'm done, I'll have like. You multiply each of those reps by three, and uh, that's fun. It's fun for me. Ryan Lampers, he just likes to hike up hills with heavy packs. Hikes and hikes. He was talking about those death hikes that he goes on. Yeah. The man is insane. <laughs> so everybody's a little different. You got to do what really fulfills you. We got a question the other day, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. Mm-hmm. Someone basically said that, how do you get yourself to the gym? When A, you don't want to, or B, you're trying to make yourself do stuff that you don't like. Like, I hate running. I'm not going to lie. I don't like running. But I know that I probably should be doing something along those lines. How do you take those first steps? Okay. So for me, what I do is I build achievable goals. And I, and I map those out for the first week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, a month, three months, five months, six months out. So if I want to be able to run, let's say, um, a 5k, you know, three miles or something, then I'm going to decide, okay, the first week I'm just going to do, uh, the bike, you know, in the gym, I'm going to work on that for maybe two weeks, three weeks. I'm going to go so, so long on the bike each day. And then maybe it's going to be, I'm going to walk up a steep hill, um, a one mile and walk back down. That might be the first two or three weeks. I'm, I'm picking things that are, I know I will guaranteed be able to do that week, mm-hmm. achievable goals that gradually progress. So by week three, I'm like, okay, now I can actually jog a little bit, let's say on the treadmill for a little distance. And then from there, it's like, okay, now, now I'm going to add, you know, instead of going one mile, I'm going to add two miles. Now I'm going to increase the pace and I slowly build over time. And if I find that, okay, I'm, I'm getting some kind of knee problem or calf pain during this, then I'm going to go back to the bicycle or to the pool. That's what happens to me is normally something in my leg gets tweaked or twinged and I can't run anymore. 
And I, I think part of that is trying to go too fast. You're trying to go from zero to 60. You're trying to go from, I never run to running overnight. And, you know, I heard David Goggins in an interview where he mentioned being 320 pounds or something overweight. And he decided he was going to run. He's going to start running. And, uh, and so he tried and it, it, he thought he's going to die. Uh, jacked him up bad legs were bad, like different things. Maybe it was his back. I can't recall. But basically what he ended up doing was he ended up going to the pool and he had to just stay in the pool for months, like run. He lived in the pool, exercising in the pool because he's just so fat. He couldn't do the other stuff and bike. He got on the different bikes at the gym and then I think out of the gym and he just rode his bike a lot because that's when you're overweight, that's a non load bearing activity, but still it's working the legs. So he finds a way to keep exercising and working through it. Uh, And I I think that's the difference between people who, who achieve those goals and don't. And so, like I said, you set your goals, you say, you know, week one, week two, week three, and you set them in a, in a, in a very realistic, achievable fashion. You need to be able to succeed every day, every week. So don't, don't make some goal you're not going to be able to achieve. So kind of set yourself up for success. With your set goals. yourself up for success little by little with baby steps gradually over a long time. It's like, you know, I've had this discussion with my wife. She, when she's trying to get leaner and skinnier and lose weight, you know, the temptation is, well, I feel like I'm 20 pounds overweight. I want to lose that weight in now, a month. Yeah. It's like, well, actually maybe it's one pound a month. Maybe it's two pounds a month. That means you're in you're in a ten month process. This takes time, but do it do it right over a long period of time. Enjoy the journey. D- don't be so focused on the destination that you actually never get to your destination. You know, don't that that's that's my theory. That's my opinion. Set yourself up to succeed. It's. I remember when I was doing the get out of debt thing. Oh, Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey, Total Money Makeover. We were talking about debt. I'm like, I need to get out of debt. And I decided to follow his plan. And his plan was pay off the smallest debt first. I'm like, well, but this one's a high interest credit card. I should probably pay that one off first. And according to the Ramsey plan, no, you you pay off the smallest debt first. And, And the reason for that simply is because it's not about the math. It's about psychology. And when you see success, you pay off this little $300 debt Mm -hmm. and it's gone. You're like, Whoa, that's, that's gone. That feels really good. Mm -hmm. And and then you tackle the next one and it's a $700 debt. And you're like, that one's gone. And then the next, and you see progress. It helps you stay motivated because it's working. You see it working. And each one of those shackles that comes off with each debt liberates you for the next one. And you realize soon, wow, I'm going to be out of debt versus the opposite where they found that when the guy tackled the $10,000 credit card with high interest revolving debt, he's two years into it and still hasn't paid it off or a year, right? When you can't see the results the same way, you don't have those shackles come off. You're still dealing with the $300 one and the $500 one and the $800 and the $2,000 debt along with the $10,000 debt. People tend to quit because they don't see results. So like he said, if it was about math, you wouldn't have been in debt in the first place. So let's not pretend the math matters. If it was about math, you wouldn't have gone into debt on a 25% interest rate on a, on a $10,000 credit card you know, limit. It is about psychology. It is about mental, uh, success. So that's why I say fitness is similar. Pick the things you can do that are achievable and make those things happen each day of the week or three days out of the week, whatever those goals are. Maybe it's just showing up at the gym and, and rowing for 10 minutes. That's it. That's, that's all you're going to do. Do that. Do that for three weeks. Pretty soon you'll be like, you know what? I can, I can, I can go five days a week, and I can go more than ten minutes on the rower, you know. And that's how you win. 
And when you see that you're achieving those little goals, they grow into bigger goals, better goals. You become stronger. You become more resilient. And before you know it, you've changed your life. So goal setting with incremental achievements. Yeah. I love uh, What About Bob? It's a brilliant movie. <laughs> Very brilliant, underrated. Very brilliant underrated. Movie. Uh, Bill Murray, Baby Steps, man. There's abs- It's wisdom <laughs> right there, my friend. Wisdom. So we've drugged this, this on long enough. Uh, enjoy this podcast with Ryan Lampers. Uh, let us know what you think. We always appreciate your kind comments and your support of the show. We love you. We're grateful for you. We thank you. Stay gritty. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm back with Mr. Lampers. We're going to answer questions that were sent in. Uh, we collected a lot of questions when we were hunting together in uh, Arizona, the mm-hmm. coos deer. And uh, we're going to go over a series of those today. So it's a little Q&A cool. from the audience. All right. So Gritty listeners sent some questions in, and, and I'm going to hit you with the first one. Okay. What hunt would you recommend the most and why and what is the cost okay what hunt would i recommend the most um i'm assuming for a newer gentleman well uh, he said uh, he put some context around it. he said just finished your donnie vincent podcast and you guys talked about your favorite animals to hunt mm-hmm. um but f- for people who haven't had a hunt for those specific animals like caribou moose or sitka blacktail it would be great to to be able to hear about where to hunt them and what it's like and how much it costs without having to do all the research. Laziness, I know, but I see it more as the old and experienced passing down wisdom. Thanks, boss. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Oh, boy. All right. Well, that was Heller Anthony sending in that question. Okay. Um, I guess first we got to figure out, is this like a best place out of state type hunt or critter type hunt? I mean, I got, I got opinions on both, but if it's for the dollars, um, obviously whatever state you're in, but if that's a tough question, <laughs> you just keep dancing around it. Like, Gosh, dang. Dive in, all bro. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, I think for a guy that wants action, that wants like stocks, I'm assuming he's a bow hunter that wants to, uh, you know, have a lot of opportunities, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if elk is your answer on that. I, uh, I think there are certain places, maybe antelope's your thing. It's not my thing, but I love late season mule deer, man. I think late season mule deer in places like, and I hate to even point out specific areas, but Eastern Montana type places where the numbers are high. I mean, Mm -hmm. that is a hunt that I cannot wait to get my daughter over to because I know she's going to love it. Mm -hmm. She's going to see stuff all day long. We're going to have ample stocks and uh, a lot of opportunities, and we are going to bring home meat. This is a bow hunt. A bow hunt, late season, rut and bucks, Um, no doubt about it. I mean, there. Well, I mean, bow hunt is bow hunt. It's not mm-hmm. always going to happen. No guarantee. But there, I don't know of many places where you're going to have more opportunities mm-hmm. in country that almost anybody can do it. Not everybody, but it's, 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 let's face it, it's gentle. It's coolie country. It's flatter land. Um, there's a lot of BMAs over there that guys will hunt. Um, a lot public of public land, land um, plenty of public land. So that for me would be a place that, uh, I would take my daughter to get her first deer be okay. just because of the fact it's so fun. And I was, I've always talked about some of the harder hunts are exciting because of the challenge, but there's something fun about seeing bucks all day. Right. I mean, you're, you're getting able, you're, you're being able to glass up critters. Maybe they're not what you're looking for or maturity wise, but you're seeing, you're just seeing animals. And for some people that's, that's it. That's what you want. Um, and then the struggle is if you're into an older age class, you just got to pass a lot of animals. But I don't know of many places where you're going to see as many bucks rutting activity. It's just fun. Yeah. That's kind of my number one. If I had to like pick any of the hunts throughout the year that I'm going to go on, <clears throat> that is one of the ones that I'm so excited about just because I know I'm going to have a ton of fun just seeing critters and doing what rut and mule deer do 
cost wise it's it's, it's out of staters probably okay, so, so in state obviously it's very cheap for mm-hmm. a montana guy out mm-hmm. of state yeah it gets spendy um you're looking at a gosh what is montana non-res i know the combo is over a thousand for the for the deer and the elk i don't know what just the deer tag is let's say 500 or something like that mm-hmm. um and then the gas that's going to get you there and then hopefully if you uh you are a frugal cheap bastard like myself you mm-hmm. pack your own food and Make up your own snacks and all that kind of your thing. Your deer tag in out of state in Montana is about the same as running on most Western states for a mule deer tag mm-hmm. out of state. You yeah. know, four to six hundred bucks. Something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And usually around five, four fifty, something like that. And I used to go all the way over there from Washington. Yeah. And that's a seventeen, eighteen, nineteen hour drive. Right, right. And it was just well worth it because uh, you know, you're seeing elk, you're seeing deer, you're seeing just so much activity and and when you're a bow hunter and you want stocks, unless you're going to like Lanai, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, in Hawaii um, for access deer or something like that, you just get a lot of stocks over there. True. I got to say that coos deer hunt, it's, it's up there on the top, man. Yeah, um, that was fun. For a number of stocks or at mm-hmm. least animals you see every day, yep. uh, coos deer bucks, you can hunt mule deer at the same time. Yep. There's Coatamundi, there's jackrabbits, there's javelina if you get the javelina tag which you can guarantee to draw the tag for your area if you put in for it pretty much i mean a lot of things to hunt yeah and you look my answer could easily be swayed with all these other hunts you and i got to spend that time in arizona and uh again that's a hunt i will do for the rest of my life it's january time of year is excellent i didn't put that in there because coos deer Still can new. be very, very tough. Yeah, I agree. For a bow hunter. Um, it's just the other, all the an- other animals you <laughs> and can again, shoot. There's, you just got to drop off the hill a little bit and get into the mule deer, right? So, yeah. Um, and then all the other things you got opportunities at. So, yeah, I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the ultimate for, for a guy wanting opportunities. I don't know. I think by the time we get back from New Zealand hunting tar, that'll public, be our public land. <laughs> Ryan's going to be, be talking about that one. Uh, I can't wait for that trip. There's a question that some wrote in that wanted to know where you actually hit the coos deer. Like, where did the arrow go in and exit? Mm-hmm. And how do you make that shot when you have jitters and anxiousness? Hmm. Uh, well, first off, the yardage on that was 18 yards. So he was tight. He was close. Uh, that arrow went in perfect it was uh right behind the shoulder the way he was complete pass through uh got both lungs um now in my early days yeah jitters would be a factor even at 18 yards you know who knows i might have you know shot that arrow right over his back but uh there's things you can do once you've had enough experiences to calm yourself down play everything out ahead of time know what's coming remember your your sequence your shot sequence so you, I don't get the the antsiness, you know, going to make a big blunder like I used to. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think that just happens with experience. But mm. yeah, they got a reputation for jumping string. That that deer was 18 yards. So and he was distracted. and he was going after the doe that just came in front of us. He was on a mission. That thing, it was just too close. And he was focused on something else to jump string or anything. So I had, and, and Brian, I, like I say, I try to think everything through. I've heard be, again, this is, that's not a hunt I've done a lot. I haven't even hunted axis deer. I don't know, but I've paid attention to what other people say. And just the fact that they do jump string, they're smaller. Um, I had that running through my mind, like, do I need to aim low? Well, he was focused. He was on a mission. He wasn't going to jump it. It was too close. I think in another scenario, uh, if he would have stood up out of his bed, maybe um, kind of detected me in a way, something like that, where he had a little bit of nervousness about him. Yeah, anticipate that jump a little bit. Aim a little lower on the body um, and just know that they're going to duck down right before, especially if he's you know 20 to 30 to 40 yards out there for sure. So you've talked about this before, but tell, tell, tell people that are listening again, what's going through your mind, uh, as you're getting to that moment before you shoot, 
like you know like like i think what he's getting at is he's really he's struggling with being nervous Mm -hmm. having those jitters being shaky what what are you telling yourself in that moment so you don't just black out when the shot comes Mm -hmm. um I'm just going through the process. I've at this point usually I've thought of every scenario. If he goes this way, that way. If he does this, does that. What am I going to do? Uh, is my left hand going to be relaxed? Am I going to pull through my shot? All that has already been played out in my head, right? So you've kind of gone through everything. Um, I think when you do that, you don't just black out and try to go off of muscle memory. Here, you know, I think when it goes to that stage and it's just like you're just watching the deer. You're not thinking about anything else. And then you're going for a shot. I used to do that. Um, yeah, you'd blow a shot on occasion. You just black out and just pull through and forget the whole process. So, so what you're telling me is you're not thinking about this is Boone and Crockett. No, (laughs) everyone's going to be blown away by this. I can't believe this is happening to me. No, those are not your thoughts. Those are not my thoughts. No, I'm thinking about, yeah, I just got a little thing. Everybody's little mantra is different. I'm thinking about relaxed left hand, pulling through my shot. Slow, 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 um, and that's about it. Let me ask you this. When you're in front of a big crowd of people and you got a microphone on <laughs> and I'm yeah. talking to you in front of a bunch of people, yeah. What are you how how do you not get how how do you I black not out. black out? I black out. <laughs> <laughs> We know that when, when you're successful my, I, at I'm this, I'm not able to <clears throat> translate my <laughs> hunting uh, process to public speaking process. It doesn't work the same. Yeah, I black out. I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> here's it's my bad. here's a, here's a, here's what I think um, to deal with. Both situations are the same. You were saying you're focused on process, mm-hmm. like so. You you you're fo- focused on execution. Okay, he's yeah. walking here. Okay, his foot's forward. All right, draw now. Okay, you're so into the process mm-hmm. that you're you're not taking yourself away from it. You're not letting yourself get nervous with thoughts like, "Oh, I hope this works," no. or "Oh my gosh, I hope this," because you're focused on the process. When you're in front of a big crowd of people and you're getting ready to talk, and you're you could look at the audience and you could go. They're all looking at me. What if I screw up? What if I don't say this right? What if I, what That's if exactly I'm an idiot? What's going what if, through my head? And you're now you're not focused on the process. No, nope. right? The process is the message, right? You're like, okay, I'm not going to focus on the fact that they're there. I'm focusing on what I'm trying to say, like the the message. The message is X Y Z, and when you're focused on that, you can't be bothered by the external externalities of the crowd. Yeah, no, it's true. It's it's easy to hear it when you say it like that, but I tell you what, <laughs> well, I don't have that problem with deer anymore, but I sure as heck do when there's some, it could be 10 people and it just, it's just nerve wracking to me. I can't, I can't get through that wall, but yeah, for deer, it just seems like if you do your part, you do everything right, you're going to make it happen. Think everything through ahead of time. And I don't have that black. I, I wish I'm the opposite. You know, I still struggle with a live animal in front of me. Mm-hmm. I still get uh, jitters and anxious quite, you know, quite a bit, but, but I am more confident all the time that I'm going to execute that shot right the proper way. But when I'm focused on, Oh, you're dead. One more step. And I'm aggressive and I'm thinking, Oh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You know what I mean? Like when I'm focused on just getting the job done, right. I'm a killer. Yeah. It's when you stop and think about something else that's external to the moment in the process that you mm-hmm. get screwed. Well, I think on a on a critter, you know, especially mule deer and everything else, you're thinking everything through. You're completely focused on what you have to do. Uh, completely different when public speaking. I just don't get that. I don't. I'm not laser focused. I'm nervous because there's eyeballs every which direction out there looking at me. Yeah, but no, there's a laser focus to it for sure. Thinking about everything um, well ahead of time, every different scenario. And I think that doesn't allow you to just go into, um, you know, that mode where you just kind of try to go off memory and things think it's just going to happen or try to pull a shot off too yeah. fast. And um, I, I think it, I think you touched panic. on it earlier. Yeah. It's foolish to think you're going into auto mode and you're going to be successful. Yeah. You have to actually be deliberate about 
each step mm -hmm. and execute. Yeah. Because if it's just, I'm pulling back and it's just automatic. Yeah, it's like the whole Joel's controlled process thing, right? You could think about it like that. Yeah. If you just think it's going to turn into, because you've shot a thousand arrows, that you're just going to pull back and be accurate every time and just, you know, go into robot mode. It never happens that way. You always have to stay focused. You always have to be in control of it. Um, yeah, I think that's how it works out when you're completely focused on actually getting that arrow into an animal, for sure. One of my best cues is to actually pick that spot on mm -hmm. the animal. To actually mm -hmm. put the pin and then focus on the pin being exactly in that spot. Yeah. Because when I was younger, more or less experienced, I had just put the pin there near, I don't know even know where it was when the shot went off. Mm -hmm. It was just across the animal's body. Yeah. But but now it's like I drill that pin to the exact spot I want that arrow to go. Right. Like, fix it there. I stick it there. Yeah. And the shot doesn't go off until it's stuck. And I'm just more confident. I just do it now. Yeah. But I but I am focused on that that kind of level of um, of steadiness with that, with the pin. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, that's kind of their mantra as well, is pick mm -hmm. a spot and focus on that. That's your focus. Yeah. Um, you also, you got to focus on, it's, like you said, the leg, if it's moving, you mm -hmm. got to focus on, you got to stop him. You got to make sure that leg's right. He's angled right. All those kind of things. But yeah, it's tough. Cause I used to sort of put the pin there and go, okay, it's in the general body cavity mm -hmm. now. And then it just I, goes off. <laughs> yeah. And now <laughs> it's like, no, I'm precisely aiming for like an organ exactly yeah. in the, it, it, I'm aiming for a, a two by two inch area. Right. And, and trying to hit that spot. Yep. And and that's the difference. Yeah. You know? No, it's it's obvious and it's it's you know, tenfold when it's a live animal. I mean you see it um in three D courses, you know, target panic and all that. You just lose focus and your shot sequence is just goes to heck. Yeah. It's bad. Just in time five fifty six asks this question. Stealthy hunter. For us normal working Joes. What's the number one tip you guys have for us weekend slash week a year hunters where time is of the essence for Western mule deer? That's easy. Mm -hmm. Do your homework. I mean, it's easy as an answer, but uh, you better have all your preparation right. You don't want to screw up um, that limited amount of time you have. So you better have gotten your physical right, your mental right, uh, your gear right. Uh, you don't want to blow a day on, you know, not, not doing the map work you should have done, the scouting, if you had time, um, in the summer, you want to make sure that none of those factors equate into, or are a part of the equation. You just, you got to have all your homework done. And okay. that's about the only thing I could think of. I mean, um, you know, from your home, if you don't have those days, try to get all the e-scouting done you can. And uh, make sure you're shooting spot on. You may only get one opportunity. Um, make sure the physical part is never an issue as far as you may have to put on some dang miles in that short amount of time. And you may have to lug that thing out in a short amount of time. Make sure that's never a factor that's going to keep you from getting that animal. So okay. homework, preparation, I guess. Okay. Anything else? Anything that uh, around gear or, or tactics? Gosh, I don't know. Don't become a bow hunter if you're limited on time <laughs> at a weekend. That'd be tough. Uh, I wouldn't have hardly any animals if I only had a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Like Time I, is huge. I, I do think that what people don't... In fact, you and I were talking about New, New Zealand and, and going there to hunt tar on a, just in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody can do it. Just fly there and go do it. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to do that little adventure. Mm -hmm. And we discussed it. If you got seven days or four days or, or seven and three or four of them are rained out and fogged out, is that really a bow hunt, you know, or is that just a fun rifle hunt? Sure. And, and it's, it's often the best, if you're going to bow hunt often, if you can give yourself two weeks, that's the difference between a guy who's successful and a guy who's oh, yeah. empty. Oh yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, time is, is the number one factor on a lot of hunts, especially if you're going for a certain age class or whatever. Um, cause man, that, for whatever reason, patience always plays a part in getting a big old buck. It always is a part of it. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of times it ends up on that last day, they end up getting them or the second to last day. Mm -hmm. If you got two days, geez, I, I can't remember many trips where I was able to score on an older age class aside from Arizona down there. That was like a, a, a fluke, but the, all the conditions were right for that to happen. But, um, most trips are a weekend, you know, mm -hmm. and that's just a matter of putting in the time and, and, uh, at that point is when you've started to figure out the pattern of the animal and had things work out in your favor. You didn't have to push, mm -hmm. push in on a critter and, um, time is huge. But obviously if you're, if you're dealing with just a couple of days, I, I think your, your sights need to be set a little lower. Yeah. Um, maybe go for a buck versus a, an older age class. I think older age class in two days is asking a lot, those type things, you know, put yourself in places where, opportunities are going to be a lot more prevalent. I think you can leverage as well in certain areas you can leverage, um, from late for depending on whether it's high Alpine mule mm -hmm. deer hunting, you know, in August or right. September or whether it's rut mule deer hunting, it, it depends. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can go out there every weekend, mm -hmm. you know, you're a college student in Montana and you're going to hit it every weekend, you know, you you can get a lot of time behind the glass and and you can get on a lot of spot and stock opportunities if you pick the right area. Yeah, I mean if in in the right state, Montana's got a long season. Washington, for example, if you're a Washington guy, rifle hunter, you got two weekends. Yeah. And that's it. Um so you are very limited with time and it's an October hunt, so they're not rutting yet. It's not August and September. They're not out in the open on the tops. Yeah. They're down in the timber. So I kind of feel like if I'm going to go just for bomb for two, uh, a two-day or three-day trip, like third season Colorado or something like that, I want to do a rifle hunt Yeah, instead oh, yeah. of a bow hunt. Yeah. So many variables, wind, all those different things that on a bow hunt, a lot of times you're sitting on your hands waiting for the conditions to be right or him to do something where you have a chance to get into 40 yards. So... A rifle hunt makes a lot more sense. But knowing that you're going into the fall with very limited time, hopefully you're stacking weekends in your summertime with some scouting, you know, yeah. and every weekend you can and, and just trying to put as many of those little two-dayers together, even if it's not for the hunt, but in the scouting sessions because uh, I don't know what else you can do. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. Reminds me of when I was college. I went fishing instead. <laughs> I got, I was able to catch fish. Yeah. We actually lived off those. Gosh. Um, you've talked about this before. Uh, would love to hear from Ryan on, uh, on keys to being a consistent killer on mature animals. And I think you cover that it is patience. It is hunting solo, mm -hmm. being patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, it, it takes time to, again, if you haven't picked one out in the off season or whatever, it takes time to learn an area takes time to find that special buck, that older age class buck. You got to learn to get good at passing on other bucks to get, to get an old age class, you know, freak things happen. But most of the time it takes quite a few days to look over the entirety of that basin or that area or your unit, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, for you to actually finally come across one that excites you or is that, that maturity level that you want. And it's, yeah, it's. It's all about that. I don't know. Um. Okay. Ask Ryan how he does it. <laughs> He's a freaking beast and has had some amazing success. What's the number one thing for going from being pretty good at hunting to being a solid killer? Oh, man. Pretty good at hunting. <laughs> uh, preparation. It, it's, it's, it sounds cliche, but I think... If you look at the, the guys, and I'm not including myself, but the guys out there that every year, I don't know what percentage of it of them there are, but they kill every year, mm -hmm. you know, elk every year, bear every year, deer every year, those type guys. Yeah. They're just putting in more work. Okay. They're doing a lot more in the off season, um, whether it's the physical, the mental, the, you know, the shooting, all those type things, the scouting, um, they're learning country more than other people are. If you only have a week to go out, you're not going to ever be that guy that kills a giant buck every year. You just can't be Mr. Consistency. It's a lot of time and effort. And, um, and you know, that comes with experience. For me, this is my 
love in life is is trying to come up with an old age class wherever I'm at. And that's, I don't know, it, it's just what I do. It's what I focus on. Probably not very fun to hunt around when I'm doing it because there's like a, I got a mission, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm on a mission here. So that's why, uh, that's why introverts are probably okay at it. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need the social, the camaraderie or any right. of that. No I mean, I like you, Brian. You. I mean, I like you being there and all, but I'm really there to kill a deer. Right, right. <laughs> I get that way too. Even yeah. though I'm pretty extroverted, um, I'm pretty singularly focused. Yeah. Until I tag out, until I kill something, I'm not the best companion to no. have around. I can be chill, but mm-hmm. at the same time, la- last year in Randy's camp, that had a hard time, never came home at lunch, mm-hmm. ever. Stayed out all day, had a hard time socializing, wanted to j- wanted to go until the last right. hour of the last minute of the last day from morning until dark. Right. Because I, 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 I do want to achieve when I'm out there. Yeah. It's just I'm wired that way. Yeah. And for example, it's just that camp alone. I mean, look at the guys that were at that camp. Bunch of fun guys. You know, Randy was there. You were there. Hush was there. But you'll notice I drove my, I drove my rig down there. Because, uh, me too. That <laughs> was not a focus. I could have, it would have been a blast just to hang out at the, um, little hacienda all day and have fun with all those cool guys. But, um, going down there, it's, there's a job to do and that's, that's it. So I was well, fortunate to get it done on day two <laughs> so I could come hang out with you guys and have fun. So, yeah, I mentioned to you, it's really tough because for me, because I'm there to get some content, to yeah. film, to get some, um, informational podcasts recorded to share with other people. And to to give them the tools to go down there and do a similar trip or motivate them or inspire them to do it. But I want to just go kill a deer and I don't Mm want to mess with having to podcast or doing anything like that until I kill a deer. Like it's hard for me to break away from that primary task. Right. On that note, persistence is big, big, Mm -hmm. I think, because I'm not the best shooter. I'm not the best hiker. I'm not the best everything Mm -hmm. when it comes to hunting but I'm, I'm persistent. Mm -hmm. Like I just keep banging my head on the wall. I just keep, keep going at it. How much do you think something like that contributes to? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, and then, and then how how do you develop it? I think, uh, if your drive is such that you want it bad enough, you'll overcome that. Cause I know in my twenties, you know, like I've said many times, I used to be a fisherman. I used to love bird hunting, chucker hunting, all that kind of stuff. And then I got the bug on the big game. Um, I killed my first buck at 14, but I never, it never really drove home until my, you know, late teens, early twenties. <laughs> but once I got that, everything is focused on that, like all of it. Um, so I kind of lost, lost my train of thought there, well, but. Cause I was going to say, I don't think you can just develop mental toughness. You just have, like, there's things you do. Right. In the off season, or I guess to put, you put yourself in positions to harden yourself for that. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So there's, there's all kinds of, you know, talking about the being better prepared than the next guy. That's going to, that alone is going to set you apart from the average Joe. Um, the off season training, whether that's with weights or just endurance cardio type stuff, that's one piece, um, putting yourself in uncomfortable uh, positions, situations where most of the time, that's what I was getting to in, in the early years when I was just getting into it, I, it wouldn't take much to pull me out of the Hills. Like, Oh, I heard my girlfriend's got an issue or whatever. Right. It's like, Oh, I better get out of here. Hunt's pretty tough. Um, you know, and you always go in with the best intentions, like I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this happen. And, and then, then you're home for two days four, and you're like, five. why did I come home? I'm exactly such a right. loser. Exactly right. And I don't like being called I'm a loser, especially by myself. So, you know, you, you go in with the best intentions and then there's like this magnet that pulls you out. I don't think I loved it as much back then as I do now. Um, you know, I think through certain experiences and whatever it was, it just drove home. This is what I want to do. There's nothing that's going to pull me out. I'm going to keep going hard every day and I don't care really what goes on in the outside world, but, um, it all becomes about, you know, that your preparation, you've, you know, a lot of us, we do races in the off season, whether that's 
death hikes or Spartan races or train to hunt events. You've, you've sacrificed a lot of time, effort, money, um, to do things that are difficult, that, you know, really challenge you, really, you know, pin you against other guys, competition type things. And so when you've done enough of those and then the hunting season comes along, last thing you want to do is give up a little bit early, right? Because you've done all this stuff mm-hmm. throughout the rest of the year. We think about it, you know, those other eight, nine months, man, you just feel like an idiot if you, if you allow yourself to quit on a hunt yeah. and not keep going harder. And, you know, you could go, you could go with all kinds of, you could go with food, the food prep. That's part of it. A lot of guys, I think, bonk on day four, four, maybe five, and their body hurts. Their body's broken down. They haven't done enough. They're not, you know, feeding it right. And, um, and they're ready to get the heck out of there. You know, when the body's not right, their mind's not right. So I think that's huge. Um, I think that's helped me now. I just, I just never get tired back there. You know, I don't care how many days I'm in there. It's, it's like, I'm just, I'm ready to keep going every day. Yeah. Um, and that's just through the physical prep, the yeah. training and the nutrition. Primarily, what would you say is one of the things you do in the off season that, that helps you develop a, uh, tougher, a tougher mind, you know, a greater degree of mental toughness. Okay. Um, I love weighted hikes. Uh, we've talked about that a lot. Train to hunt events are great. They, uh, they really test your will. Um, uh, working out, man. I mean, all these different workouts you do myself. I know you like, like CrossFit style thing that tests you. I just like getting to the top of a mountain as fast as I can with weight in the back at all costs and it hurts and it sucks, but, uh, you're going to do it. So, you know, I think those type things, uh, putting yourself on a calendar as far as like, whether it's a half marathon, a marathon, a, a death hike. I do that every year now. Um, you know, a Spartan, a train down, any of those mm-hmm. events, putting yourself on there, it holds you accountable. You, you put the money down, you're going to do it. And then you can look back at those things later and say, well, I did that. You know, I hiked yeah. 93 miles or, you know, um, I just like, even outside of like a death hike, uh, do a ridiculously hard, hard challenge, pick spot. It's 15 miles in, it's 15 miles out. Do that in a day. And it's going to be difficult and it's going to probably hurt a little bit, but don't give yourself opportunity to not get it done and just do it. And then you can, you can draw on that later in the off season or in the, in the hunting season mm-hmm. and look back and say, Hey, I did that. Before. I've done that before. And I think over time you don't have to look back on it. You're just, you just know you're tougher. Yeah. <laughs> like you can do this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's easier. So I think more every year you do more and more events, get more and more experience. You just develop a mental toughness to you. And I, I don't, I don't think there's any other way to do it than to put yourself in uncomfortable positions, even with weather, you know, Mm -hmm. go hiking in the heat, go hiking in the freezing cold. I mean, we hiked this year now in Bozeman. Um, I don't just have to hike in heat. I get a hike, hike in minus temps. So we run up the M every, every day, even when it's five below and just do it, um, and that hurts the lungs, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you does. do it. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever thought about Wim Hof? Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's again, it's I think that creates some serious mental and toughness, and doing difficult things. Cause everything, things. when you jump in an ice cold bath outside in the dead of winter oh yeah, and everything in your body is screaming, get out, get out, yeah. get out. And, and but to you make have yourself what it takes stay to for stay. five minutes or 10 minutes, that. And you start doing that. It's such a hard thing. Right. I think it does oh, yeah, absolutely. mentally harden you. Yep. You know, you might only do it a minute mm-hmm. and then two minutes and then five. And Yeah. And that's all that is, is just developing a mental toughness. My brother did it for seven or eight months. Yeah. I was wondering why he quit. And he, he went off to college. Okay. And got away from the the outdoor lake and, you know, and, and mm. just became out of habit. But... Um, became harder to do, but I, I would say during that period and he was struggling, mm-hmm. you know, he had, he had some issues he was overcoming at that time and, um, his ability to go get in that water and sit there and then come out every day mentally changed him Yeah, I'll bet. into a different man. I'll bet. I mean, it takes I thought he was going to quit after a lot of willpower the first week to be able to I, do that in the cold, man, for sure. And he knew it. He's like, man, if I can just keep doing this Mm -hmm. uh, in three months, five months, a year, you know, who knows, 
let's see where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And that mental toughness translated, it's like, man, I've done other things that are hard. Yeah. And I can, I can do it. Yeah. You know, this, this is, this is harder than this. Yep. I can do it. Nope. Yeah. My wife did it for a while. Um, we had a pool in the back, just a yeah. little, you know, three foot pool, whatever. And, uh, she did it like all winter one time where she'd have to go out in the morning, like in her bathing suit, like break the ice with her feet before she jumped <laughs> off the ladder and then go in and do that. <sighs> and look, it, that is a great way to build mental toughness, but that was not my way. That yeah. was her way. She right. did great at it. I would rather go suffer and sweat my <laughs> tail off on a mountain with heavy weight and just yeah. keep the grind up. But Question for you in terms of, I think one of the things that people struggle with the most is failure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people fail at a certain task. Mm -hmm. They're sneaking up on a 170 inch buck and it's the biggest buck they've ever been on. And they get to within 20 yards and blah, blah, and everything happens except they just, they just miss the shot. Yeah. Mentally after being so close and then not achieving your goal after waiting 360 days to go and do it. Right. And here you are and you fail. Sometimes that's all it takes. And a guy's done. Goes yeah. home. Oh yeah. Quits. How do you insulate yourself or, 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 you know, how do you overcome failures or what kind of situations do you like to put yourself in where you fail so you can learn to overcome it? Mm. Um, I think that goes with experience. I don't know if there's anything you can tell yourself as a young guy to get over that. Cause it sucks. I mean, when you <laughs> fail and especially if you're like well into your trip and you got a couple of days left and you finally got your stock and it blows up. Um, wind gets you, whatever. And that is a suck fest. You know, you just, it sucks. But, um, I think, uh, all you can do, and that's all I can do th these days, even is just tell yourself now I really got to do it. Now I really got to push because now I got a couple of days left. Um, and it goes back to, if you want it bad enough, it's the only thing you can do. You're not going to give up. So that's not an option. You do that, you know, it's going to suck when you go back home and, and, um, you got to think about that for the rest of the year. So you just kind of have to think those things through. I mean, think of the future, think of, think of how it's going to suck if you just quit. And I know guys that quit, you know, they get their shot and they're done, mm -hmm. but man, you, all you can do is, uh, try harder and, and keep, keep working at it. And I don't know what else you could tell a guy, but think it, think it through and know that now your time is really limited and you just got to keep pushing. You heard that quote. It goes something like pain is, is awful. Pain, pain is, it sucks, but quitting lasts forever. Mm -hmm. Like pain is only for a moment. Yeah. Quitting, quitting is with you forever. Yeah. And there have been times where I'm like, I'm going to be out for 12 days straight or 14 days straight. And you're back on day four <laughs> and you're like, just for two days, just, just cause I, right. whatever you, you got rained on. And, and so you came home. You can't kill an animal from the couch, mm -hmm. you know, and I can think back to a few of those times, oh, you yeah. know, and coming home and, and being at home going, I'm only home three, four hours. And I'm like, and you're feeling, why guilty. am I here? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And it doesn't have to happen, have to happen too many times, <laughs> a couple times. Right. And you know, what's coming. So when you're on a hunt and you blow it, think back. Think back to quitting on that previous trip, what it felt like, you know, feeling like you're just weak. Um, I know I don't want to feel like that. So all you can do is just push on and, and think back to when you did quit prior uh -huh. and, and go off of that experience and, and learn from it. How many times have you been at that lowest of lows and you're just like, I can't believe this. And then hours later or... or a day or two later, you, you have achieved what seems like the impossible. Almost every elk hunt ever. <laughs> <laughs> because elk hunting, it seems like when it really gets quiet and it just seems ghostly out there and nothing's happening and you've maybe blown a few things, it's usually at that point that it happens. I don't know why. I can't even tell you how many times on an elk hunt you're like, holy smokes, five minutes can't ago. that. I would have thought this is never going to happen. And then boom, it That's goes. It. Yeah. And then you have a few of those experiences and that helps in not getting that low of lows. You just know it could happen at any point. When I shot that whitetail in Ohio this year, big sexy, that was on the last hour of the last day. 
And yep. sitting in the same tree stand for four days in a row on like a five day hunt had me a little worried. Yeah. You know, but, oh, yeah. but I, I, it was along those lines like it only takes one moment. Yep. It only, and, and sure enough, right? At last light, with just enough light to shoot. Boom. There he is. And within 60 seconds, you know, two minutes, he's, he's, he's giving me the shot. I'm, I'm settling the pen, pulling through. Yep. And, and that's it. It's one minute. You're like, well, looks like my trip to Ohio was a bust. Never even saw the buck I wanted. Never laid eyes on him. Yeah. You know, the buck I was after. And then, and then, and then, and then one second, everything changes. Everything changes. And it only changes if you stick it out. Stick it out. And, yeah. Keep with it. It's true. No. And I hope, I hope young guys just hear, you know, folks that have had it happen enough that, they use other people's stories yeah. and stick it out. You know, that the whole story of patience kills the buck, um, happened to me this last year in Washington. I mean, it was a, it was a week long hunt up there. And, um, I knew the buck was on that mountain somewhere, but it was the quietest morning. It was the last morning. Mm -hmm. Um, we'd passed, you know, I'd passed d different bucks. I had my, my cousin come with me that morning and, uh, it was the absolute quietest morning of all, nothing going on, ghostly, not a noise in the woods and, uh, never felt low. Wasn't bummed that it was the last day. Um, and then it just happened like magic. It's like, <laughs> we're just like, I think we had already made like our second cup of coffee and, you know, we're not bummed out. It's a great day on the mountain, but it's our last day and the big buck wasn't there that morning. And then he was, and there's like, we heard a, a rock roll and now he's standing 150 yards below us and we got the buck and it was the very last day. And it happens like that so many times. It's unexplainable. Yeah. Last day bucks are like a phenomenon. I'll never know why <laughs> that happens that's where like that. At last day elk for us. Yeah. It just happens, man. That's one thing I've thought about. Check this, that line of reasoning out. I've been like, okay, since they always die on the last day. Why don't I make my hunt a six-day hunt instead of a 12-day hunt? <laughs> then I'll kill one on six days instead Perfect. of 12. I don't know. I don't think that quite works that no, way. But no. um, Katie Miller 56 asks this question. I noticed Stealthy Hunter doesn't use a stabilizer when hunting. <laughs> what are his thoughts? Oh, man. Oh, man. All the great archer guys out there that the pro shooters are going to think I'm an idiot, but no, I don't. I, I peel that thing off because I'm a weight weenie, I guess, but I might've asked this before, but maybe, yeah, I don't take long shots, Brian. <laughs> and I practice without a stavy all the time, right? I shoot a stavy a lot of the year, but, uh, inside of 40, inside of 50, inside of 40, um, doesn't really matter. People huh? will disagree with this, but I cannot tell a difference in my shot inside of that. And I just don't shoot beyond that. So, um, you know, I think a stabilizer is going to be much more important beyond that, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of weight and I just peel it off and I shoot really good. I know another guy that does the same thing and he shoots really well without the stabby. So why have the weight when you shoot the same? And that's, yeah. that's my range that I'm comfortable with always. That's what I'm going to stick to. And, uh, but, but I've seen you off. shoot. I've done training to hunt. I've, I've shot with you mm. many rounds. You're an excellent shot out to longer range, long range. Mm. Uh, but so why, if you can do it out on the, uh, the course out mm. to 80 effectively, why not when you're hunting? Um, I guess I've just set a personal limit as far as critters, live animals. Okay. Um, not knocking long range guys or anything, but that's just my limit. That's what I'm comfortable with. That's what makes me feel like I, I did my job. I got to this point. That's where I set my limit. And I know I can make that shot without a stabby, you know, you're patient on 3d courses, little challenges, 80 yards. Yeah. Yeah. I could probably make that shot, but, um, I don't know. I just like it to be a guarantee. I don't like being shocked that I made it. I like it. <laughs> To be like a <laughs> slam dunk. This is, this is a, no, animal. no question. Right. Yeah. Right. And I've been very fortunate with that. I've been extremely lucky in the last 10 years where I haven't made a very bad shot. I had one that I can remember and it was an elk and, uh, yeah, thought I was putting it in the right spot, hit him in the shoulder and 
my arrow fell out about 50 yards and he, and he ran off and that was a real bummer. But, and that was a, like a 20, 25 yard shot. <laughs> I just thought I was looking at something I wasn't. Yeah. Um, but, um, fortunately I think that limiting myself and just trying to get into a certain range is, has allowed for less bad shots and less animals running away. So, yeah. Makes sense. Yep. Um, do you find there's any, you know, cause you're not using a back bar or anything else. Do you find that you, you have any problems with torque or anything when you have your quiver of arrows on one side and, and, you nah, know, and you're shooting? That or? just comes in with the, with the whole shot sequence, okay. you know, but you know, making sure your level, your level, your bubble left hand loose and, and going through the shot process. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so Ryan, this is a deep questions from our yeah. Nico. Okay. It says, uh, Lampers, do you carry a wind checker or does the long hair pick up wind direction for you? Dude, I don't need a wind checker. <laughs> you see my lovely locks blowing in the wind. That's all I need, Brian. Right on. <laughs> uh, uh, I need more of those questions. <laughs> that one That one was easy for you? I like that. That was easy. Okay, on a typical mule deer hunt, Ryan... I don't know if you if that exists, but <laughs> well, sure. a typical mule deer hunt. How many stocks do you go on and fail before you finally kill a mule deer? Man, it varies. It really does. I used to go on a lot more stocks than I do now. I, I like trying to pick out a buck these days and really focusing on that one buck and and uh, having the days off and the patience to. It's never a hundred percent but really give myself a very high percentage chance of getting in on that buck. I don't do a whole lot of reckless stocks anymore, especially if he's a big old mature animal. Not to sound arrogant, not many, not many, quite honestly. So you're willing to wait willing to multiple wait. days yeah. to yeah. get the right. I think you can kind of figure out that's an iffy stock. And mm -hmm. uh, instead of taking that iffy stock, obviously it's an animal you want. Uh, I would just rather... Play the safe game, the long game. Um, mm -hmm. I try to give myself more days maybe than gotcha. the average guy. Yeah. And uh, and go with the very, very high percentage stock. So I don't do a whole lot of failed stocks anymore like I used to. I used to just boom, 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 boom. One this morning, one the afternoon, one the evening. Fold, maybe not, but I'm going to yeah. give it a shot. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. Okay. Back to the patience thing. Mark Swallow says, when someone is really good at something... They make it look easy. He seems to be a very humble guy, but I bet deep down he has the occasional weird, that was easy <laughs> kind of thought. Uh, yeah. I mean. <laughs> like yeah, Coos Deer yeah, Box. Coos Deer, I'm thinking right. Coos Deer Day 2. I, <laughs> that was like Day 2. Got my Coos Deer. And he's a good one. I was shocked. And, uh. And yeah, that was one of those times. Usually doesn't happen that way, but 18 yard shot on a coos deer buck. Yeah. Yeah. That that's one, awesome. That one felt easy, even though it was like an all day deal and it just worked out. But. Okay. There's a lot of questions about your bow, your arrows, your, mm. your gear, mm -hmm. uh, as far as your shooting rig and your release and all that. But sure. let's get into that on a separate show. I can hear your stomach rumbling, dude. You need another peanut butter ball. All right. Last question. Well, there's not, it's not the last one. There's a lot, but <laughs> uh, last question for this podcast. All right. Hit me. Pick one of your most memorable uh, hunting story. Okay. One of my most memorable hunts. Gosh. All right. I'm going to hit you with the one that sticks out. Um, Washington, high country, elk. One of the worst weather years I can ever imagine. It was Joe and I, and uh, we had two weeks. We put a absolute crud ton of miles on. Um, the weather was garbage. It was foggy, windy, rainy. Every single day it rained. It was just relentless and brutal. There's nobody, nobody up there just because of the weather. We hammered that. Gosh, we must have hunted nine, ten days. And uh, we weren't getting callbacks. We weren't even getting close. And it was just one of those hunts that nothing was happening. So much weather, so much wet that uh, 
Joe's feet ended up just going south on him. Swollen every day from water, not even able to dry out. We didn't have a stove. We were in our little tents, little hubbas. Joe just couldn't take it anymore. His feet were toast. 20 miles that day, we got out back to the trucks. Um, his feet looked like they'd been rubbed with sandpaper. Oh. It was just bad. It, they were just raw. It was, it was gross. Rained all night. Got to the trucks. Joe headed home to go recover his feet. Just He was going to you know, relax for some days and um, come back on a different hunt later in the season, a late hunt or something like that. I went to a different trailhead. From there, went to a different trailhead. I think it was an eight mile hike in to basically a similar area to where we were. That whole hiking back in thing by myself when there was nothing going on. And it was probably the worst downpour to where even my headlight was just hard to see. It was just coming down so dang hard, man. It was brutal. And it was probably just a crazy thing to do. But I hiked all night. I got in there and uh, it cleared up that night that I got in there, it just quieted down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I heard a couple elk screaming down in the basin below me, soaking wet, but high hopes. That morning I got up, uh, the elk were still talking. I ended up getting around, coming down below them, getting below them on this basin and, uh, working a bull started raining for whatever reason. He wasn't the biggest bull, but he's the biggest bull that we had seen the biggest bull that I could get to play with me. I ended up getting that bull called in to, uh, to 25 yards and he wasn't a giant, but he was a five by six. And I ended up getting that bull that next day. And you can't even believe like the feeling of accomplishment I had, because that was the absolute worst torture I'd ever been through <laughs> with the weather. And, uh, you know, he just soaked, soaking wet the whole time. The photos I have of that bull, I'm completely drenched, rain gear, top to bottom. And, um, you know, I, I ended up, uh, you know, getting a, a packer to come get that bull out. But I hiked out that night, and it did the exact same thing. It rained as hard as it could rain the entire time. And I got back to my truck. and That's oh, why Washington and Oregon suck. Oh, my gosh. That was... <laughs> That hunt will always stick out because it just shouldn't have happened. Like it felt like it should have never happened. The weather was just completely against us. I didn't have my hunt partner anymore, but I crawled back in there and ended up getting a dang bull. And that is probably my second bull. smallest bull <laughs> I've ever got. Yeah. But that's the one bull because of the conditions and just the adversity that we had the entire week of nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but I finally, I got that stinking bull and I couldn't have been happier. So, and on that note, folks, <laughs> you want to be successful, dig a little deeper. Yeah. Get stealth, stay healthy, get stealthy <laughs> or smart. Dang man. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's hunting in the rain like that. That's brutal. And yeah. to kill a bull eight miles in and then pack it out yourself. Well, I didn't pack it. I've caught, I got a packer to come get that Did bull you? for me because yeah, it was just, it would have been too much. And Joe couldn't come help me. Right. His feet were just destroyed. And and so uh, that was one of those times I, I called a packer and had him help me. But, um, yeah, talk about a game of just trying to grind out, mm -hmm. get through the mental part of, I'm actually going back up where we haven't had any action in a complete downpour in yeah. the dark, getting up there. I'm going to have to find a place to camp. So one, it's that type of stuff where if you've been in the Washington high country, any flat spot you find in that kind of conditions is a puddle. Yep. So you're putting your tent up in a puddle. Yep. And it's just mind numbing. What is the wettest, wettest hunt you've ever been on? It was that one. Yeah. That was it. I mean, he's, I could have had these boots, crispy boots on the whole time. They're soaked. You just get soaked. You yeah. just can't get around it. Good rain gear. You're getting soaked. The wettest one I was on was Prince of Wales Island. Yeah. Hunting uh, in August. We were, and we were hunting for sick of blacktail. Gotcha. Is my brother-in-law, Travis and I. I have that video. I've never shared it. I need to, I need to publish it. I need to put it out. It's old, old video, but, um, I don't know, from mid two thousands. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it just rained like torrential for days and days and days and fog. And, you know, I ended up killing a couple of bucks. I actually got 
shot three bucks. It was a, it was a rough, but the, my, I had some Loa Zephyrs. Oh yeah. And they were wet on day one. <laughs> Those are not going to keep your And basically out. every day was just, wa- it was like walking around with, um, just in. Yeah. The water's like, just like. Just wet. Spooging out of the top wet. of your, your boot yeah, the whole like time. Yeah. Spongy wet. My feet were wet for like 12 days straight. Just. Yeah. Never really dried out. Yep. It was rough. But those are the ones that make the best stories. And those are the adventures. Like if you can get through one of those hunts and get and be successful and, and come away from it, man. I mean, I don't know that there's, I mean, y'all know that you, you, once you've been successful, that ride home, mm-hmm. even by yourself after just a grinded out hunt, I don't know that there could have been a better time. I'm finally starting to dry out and I accomplished what I wanted, killed that bull in almost impossible conditions. Yeah. That is the absolute best feeling that you'll ever have as a hunter. And that's why that story will always like, be right there. It's not the biggest bull by any stretch, but I, man. I crept up on a little tiny coos deer buck, young buck, and I shot him with my bow in a little break in the sun we had. And in one of the tiniest little deer I've ever shot in my life <laughs> and still feels like one yeah. of the biggest trophies I've ever. And I was nervous as heck. And it was one of my, you know, hadn't killed a lot of animals with a bow at that point. It was really neat. Yeah. So. I think it's always going to be the adventure part, the worst adventure. Um, my my next story would have been my first deer because that one about killed me. But uh, it's always those ones that are going to jump out at you. We're I don't. Gonna, we're going to need to get that yeah. because I hear you that those adventures, they, because when I left POW, it wasn't about the deer I had shot. Right. It was the fact that I endured a tsunami trying to drown us. Right. We had to hike miles to cross a river that when we walked up the mountain was, was like a foot wide, two feet wide. Right. And was now waist deep and 15 feet across (laughs) by the time we came down. Same channel. Just, just a ocean storm, you (laughs) know? And, Nasty. But you come home from that and you're like, man, I, I was tough. I'm tough. Yeah. You know, you're like cloud nine and you think you can accomplish anything. And, and that, again, I think those type of experiences, uh, you kind of have to have, um, in your elder years to keep you on the mountain, keep drawing on those. And remember you did that. You did these impossible, what seemed impossible type things in the past and, and use that for, for future hunts and, future scenarios where it just seems like it's not going to happen. And I think in today's world, there's not enough adventure. Oh, no. Men and women are not having adventure. Nope. In, in That's the sense. That's why we're such a lucky community to have this knowledge of hunting. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't know that it is even there. They don't know the feeling they would get if they tried it. And, uh, yeah, no, that's where all my adventure comes from is, is, uh, hiking hills and hunting. Yeah, some mild danger, deprivation, discomfort, those things all failure. You know, all those things uh, beating you down to the very basics of existence, right. food, water, shelter. Yeah. Those things right there and mm-hmm. then trying to achieve those each day. Yeah. And patience. I mean, patience is is a learned skill, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've got two daughters now. I... uh I think if I'd have had my two daughters in my twenties, I would have been not, not the best father. My patience wasn't very good back right. then. Whereas now I, I can let things roll off and, and be a lot more patient with my kids. And I think hunting has taught me that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Well, thanks Ryan. Absolutely. A lot of, a lot of good, uh, good information in this podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm real excited. All right. Uh, thanks for tuning in folks. You can follow Ryan on Instagram at S T H E A L T H Y. Stealthy. Stuh healthy. I go both ways. All one way. Stuh healthy. Yeah. I don't know what's better. And then, uh, also his podcast, Hunt Harvest Health that he does with his awesome wife, Dr. Hillary Lampers. You got questions, send them his way. Get on his Instagram. DM the fella. (laughs) All right. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty, friends. Stay gritty.